In this video, we would be discussing about how to learn quantum mechanics. This video would be a kind of a study guide for you where I would be discussing about the methods, what are the approaches that you should take, what are the best books that you should read to learn quantum mechanics, what is the mathematical prerequisite required to learn quantum mechanics, what are the books for those mathematics to learn, what are the best YouTube lectures available for you, what are the basic concepts, what are the basic misconceptions which people make while learning quantum mechanics and how do you approach using those books and approaches. So consider this to be one single video which will enable you to learn quantum mechanics right from the beginning till the end covering all the books, aspects, methods and approaches. So I would request not to skip any chapter of this video because each of them are intricately related to each other. If you miss one chapter, maybe you won't be able to take up the next chapter, which is equally very important. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel, Physics for Students. A warm welcome and a very happy new year. May this 2023 bless you with all the best of your health, spirits and knowledge. So before we start uh, taking a leap into the methods and approaches of quantum mechanics, first let us look into what are the topics that we are covering. So first we are covering uh, what is called a mental preparation that we would discuss. Uh, from classical system, how we move to quantum system, what is a classical and quantum system, what are the fundamental concepts that you must know. What is the mathematics that we must know to learn that quantum mechanics? And what are the books in order to learn those mathematics? What are the books to learn the concepts of quantum mechanics? What is the sequence of study which should be studied first and then next? And what are the best YouTube lectures which are available? And what are the common mistakes that mostly people make? So in order to go forward with this journey, understand that we would be covering a lot of topics which are very important and very important for you to learn the basic fundamentals and then based on the fundamentals how we can move ahead. So I think we have set our goals, the topics are being discussed. So let us start and start our journey. Okay, so first of all I would like to speak what is called a paradigm shift and what we need as a kind of a mental preparation in order to move into quantum mechanics. Now, when you say mental preparation, what I'm trying to tell is that if you consider the old classical system, and if we start with this mathematician and philosopher Rene Descartes, who is formed the uh, Cartesian uh, coordinate system, and then we move to Newton and further to Galileo, and then we take up Michael Faraday and Maxwell and Albert Einstein, all these classical physicists basically define these things. These are classical mechanics. There has got a deterministic behavior. The future is predictable. That means we can, given the conditions, we can tell what the future is about. And something is very definite. Something is very clear that we can point out. So this is basic essence of what is called a classical system. Starting from René Descartes to Albert Einstein, these are the points which basically those philosophers and scientists speak of. Now, when we take of a brain, say for example, the way our brain is wired to classical system, then our brain starts making mental images that this is a fish, this is a cat, this is a chair, and this is a cup of coffee or a mug. Now, what I am trying to make a point over here is that all this classical system are wired in our brain in order to understand something which is called a certain or a certainty. So because our brain is mentally or right from the uh, our birth is wired to classical system where we can see and predict and uh, see those things which are definite, so there will be a kind of a mental shift when we move from this classical world to the quantum world. 
What is that? I will just explain to you in the next part of this video. So we will take those classical physicists all along and when we move from the classical mechanics directly to these people like Richard Feynman, Einstein, uh, Max Planck, uh, then Max Born, and then we see Paul Dirac and Werner Heisenberg, then what we find is that there is nothing definite. That means we are moving into a world where nothing is definite. And most importantly, there is a probability that we might find something, we might not find something. And also there is an element of chance. That means how much percentage we can find an object. And these chances range over what we call the distribution or a probability distribution which you would see. So the mental preparation that we have to keep it in mind is that from this classical system, when we are moving into a probabilistic world, we cannot find anything definite. Now, it might sound very obvious that yes, quantum mechanics is all about probability, we know. But when we study and start learning quantum mechanics, the basic problem is that each and every point we are trying to define something, whether be it be amplitude, whether it is a velocity, whether it is a force. Because our brain, right from our birth, childhood is wired into something definite. But we have to get out of that, we have to empty our cup and get into something which is totally new. And that is why we need a mental preparation. We move into the next part of the video, which is called From Classical to Quantum System, How Do We Move? So, in a classical system, we get a classical world, we move into quantum world. We get a deterministic to probabilistic world. From a certainty, we move into uncertainty of things. And from common sense, we get something which is really weird and bizarre. And this is devoid of common sense. Taken all these things together, what we call is a paradigm shift. That means we have to shift from a mental framework of certainty to something which is very uncertain. Now, before going ahead in learning how to learn uh, quantum mechanics, I would quickly like to define what is a classical system. Now, in classical system, we won't be talking about logic or, uh, you know, calculus or something, but we would talk of something very, very philosophical, something very deep-rooted uh, in physics, which is important to our learning. Now, when we talk of a classical system, again, taking those people who are classical physicists, what we get is a set of rules. These set of rules guide set of principles and there is certain underlying logic. Now what happens is that these set of rules and underlying logic make up classical mechanics and we get a deterministic and yet a reversible system. And it can predict the future and how the set of events will behave if we know the present. Now what do we mean by reversible system? Let us look at it in the uh, next part of our video. So before looking into that, we need to define what is a system. In physics or classical mechanics, uh, I would say a collection of objects, particles, fields, waves, I mean to say whatever is called a system. So it can be arrows like this, it can be photons, it can be an electromagnetism or anything. A system that is either the entire universe or so, so is isolated from everything else and that it behaves as if nothing else ever existed is called a closed system. Understand that we are not taking relativistic world, so we are taking a non-relativistic system. It is isolated from everything else and behaves as if nothing else existed. Now, begin with a classical example. It is very trivial. Let us imagine and, okay, so it doesn't exchange any matter with surrounding. So, let us, uh, you know, just example, an abstract example. For example, we could think of this coin and it is glued to the table or we can just see one part of that and it is always showing forever the heads, right? Now, in physics jargon, the collection of all states occupied by a system is its space of states, right? So, a mathematical set whose elements label the possible sets is called the state space. So, the space, remember the state space is not ordinary space. It is a mathematical set whose elements label the possible states of the system. Now, here the state space consists of a single point, namely heads. So, predicting the future is extremely simple. 
nothing will happen and the outcome will always be heads right so the future will predict only heads nothing else because we can see that okay so this is called what is called a single state system but as we move into physics things become complex let us see what is waiting for us next so we go to something which is called a two state system right so uh, in in case of a two state system if we have an abstract object for example a head and a tail imagine a coin and uh, it is smooth that means there are no jumps or interruptions such behavior is said to be continuous now you obviously you cannot move between heads and tails smoothly but anyway moving in this case necessarily occurs in discrete jumps so let us assume that time comes in discrete jumps as integers so uh, in classical system we evolve smoothly and there are no discrete jumps so from head if we move directly to head so we get something like head 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 right so i'm directly moving from head to head and if you get tail and we again redirect it to tail then the outcome is tail 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 right now we have got something so th this is a system now we get something which has got a time so a system that changes with time is called a dynamical system right so a dynamical system consists of both and a space of states it also entails the law of motion or dynamical law uh, the dynamical law is a rule that tells us the next state of the given current state so uh, i mean to say very simply dynamical law is that whatever the state at some instant is okay now we go into something which is called a second possible law for example we get uh, the ar uh, head and tail and the arrows goes from head to tail and then another arrow goes from tail to head so we can still predict the future and we take uh, uh, something like the greek letter sigma uh, which is one for head and tail uh, negative for tail then it will come if we start uh, origin from head we get head tail head tail head tail and if we take tail then it will be t h t h t h simple right so we can even write these dynamical laws in the equation form and which is this greek letter sigma which shows degree of freedom right so sigma can have only two values either one or negative one so when we talk of degrees of freedom we mean to say that the number of independent parameters that define its configuration or state right now we use a symbol time t in order to uh, track the time and when we are considering a continuous evolution in time we can symbolize it with t and remember that we have a discrete evolution and we use n for discrete evolution so for head automatically we can write in this equation sigma n plus 1 and for tail we write it as negative t now the entire uh, approach of this is to show you that what in classical system is a system uh, and predicting the future how it becomes easy now we just talked about reversible system if you remember just a few slides back so now we will see that what is a reversible system now before that i would like to give you a caution that according to the rules of law of classical physics not all laws are legal it is not enough for a dynamical law to be deterministic now, now for example uh, if i take a kind of a uh, this kind of a say say for example 1 i am going to 2 and from 2 i am going to 3 and there is a reverse direction from 3 i will come back to 2 if i take this kind of a situation and if i redraw that and for example i am standing at this position right so where to go next now if i you, i were at 1 i can go to 2 and if at 2 i can go to 3 and if at 3 go to 2 there is no ambiguity about the future now the meaning of reversible in the context of physics can be described in a few different ways the most coincised description is to say that if you reverse the arrows which i have shown you in a uh, per in, in a kind of a different color the resulting law will still be deterministic now suppose i am standing at 2 now question is that where was i just before that now i could have come from 3 or from 1 but the diagram just doesn't tell that uh, where i am so i can be from here i can be from here but uh, you know the diagram just does not tell even worse in terms of reversibility i can say that from here to here i cannot tell so there is a question 
So what uh, infers from here is that there must be one arrow to tell you where you are going and one to tell where you are coming. In this case, the system is basically what is called irreversible system. And state 1 has no past because it cannot go back. And there is no stage which will lead to 1. That means there is no arrow which is showing me that I am going to 1. So this is a particular example of what is called a reversible system. Now given a kind of a classical system which we already just discussed, it is deterministic. If given certain arrows, we can predict the future. We will see that something weird and bizarre is happening in a quantum system. Okay, so the quantum system happens that it occurs for no reason at all, right? And uh, it here the nature is discrete. So the laws of quantum mechanics strictly follows the discrete in the energy distribution. So from classical world, when we move to quantum world, you see a spectrum of line. Uh, these are the wavelengths. Now, if we take the typical Bohr atom model, then what we find is that the energy levels are discrete. Therefore, there are finite integers, right? It cannot take any shape. It is not continuous. It is finite. So, from quantum world, we uh, come to what we call how much and how much leads to the discrete value problem. I mean to say the discrete value scenario. So, here the nature is discrete. It is not continuous and the energy levels of either the atoms or the wavelengths of a particular spectrum that the color of the atom emits, these are all discrete, these are all finite. Okay, so we move into the next part which is the probabilistic nature of quantum system. So you can now take a comparison how things are changing. Remember quantum events occur for no reason at all. I would say rather these tiny objects have a probability distribution that describes their location and momentum, a few other things such as they will spontaneously break into some other things, etc. So the only thing that they can predict is the probability of detecting. That means I can probably detect that the outcome would be this or this. So if I get a photon like this which is moving, I can say that where it will land to those two black dots. I can say maybe 42% here, maybe 58% here. So it is all probabilistic and now you can see from a state of a system which is classical in nature, this is something uh, a totally probabilistic. Now this is something which made our dear Einstein very, very unhappy. And in his letter to Max Born, Einstein made one of his famous comment and he told that in the letter that quantum mechanics is very impressive but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing. The theory says a lot, but does not really bring us closer to the secret of the old one. I, at any rate, am convinced that God does not play dice. So, Einstein expressed sentiments uh, similar to this in many occasions throughout his life, and Einstein became fond of insisting that God does not play dice with the universe. However, we will move on to our second part, which is called a superposition. It's very simple. An electron is occupying two states simultaneously. This is weird. As I told you, it is devoid of common sense, but that is how the quantum world is. So this is a classical system where you see the, uh, the blue ball either will be out or in, whereas in a kind of a classic quantum system, it is in both the states, right? I'm using this Dirac notation, which I will explain later. So if I toss a coin up, that means the coin is both in head and tail conditions until it lands up and then it shows a head or a tail. The similar kind of an expression has been used by Erwin Schrodinger in his framers Schrodinger's cat, that the cat is lying and it is both dead and alive until you uh, see that cat. So there is a poison bar which is uh, when it fires as soon as it opens the door and the superposition of the cat is it is both dead and alive. We come to another very bizarre quantum uh, system phenomena which is called a wave particle duality which uh, J. J. Thompson uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1906 for his discovery that electrons are particles. Now his son uh, George Paget Thompson also won the Nobel Prize in showing that 
you know, electrons are waves. Now, question is who was right? The answer is both of them are true. The so-called wave-particle duality, uh, which uh, is a cornerstone of quantum physics, it appeals applies to light as well as electrons, right? So sometimes it plays to think about light as an electromagnetic bit, but at the other time it is more useful to picture it in the forms called photons. So we have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explain the phenomena of light, but together they do. This was proclaimed by Einstein. So as you see that we are learning quantum mechanics, these things are very important for us to learn. We will quickly touch over what is called a decoherence and wave function collapse. It's very simple. Quantum decoherence is a loss of quantum coherence. Coherence means in the sense uh, you can say logic, right? Or the way things should happen. So in quantum mechanics, particles such as electrons are described as wave function. So here is a dice which I am throwing right up. So it is in superposition as long as the dice is in the air. And when the observer sees that dice, when it lands over here, the wave function is said to collapse. And this collapsing of the wave function, uh, a mathematical representation of the quantum state of system, a probabilistic interpretation of the wave function used to explain various quantum effects. Now, as long as there exists a definite phase correlation between different states, the system is said to be coherent. Decoherence can be viewed as a loss of information from a system onto the environment since every system is loosely coupled with the energetic state of its surroundings. That means uh, the, uh, the coherence is as long as there is a phase relation and decoherence happens immediately when there is a loss and the wave function collapses. So when the dice is thrown, it is in several eigenstates, but when it collapses, it is in uh, there is a, a wave function collapse. So, coherence to decoherence. Now, we come to another very important uh, question, which is called a superposition, which is an electron can be simultaneously at all the locations. I, I think this is something we just explained. So, uh, that is how things really happen. Okay. So, now we move to the next uh, important thing, which is called quantum entanglement. Now, you, you have heard about Bell's theorem and Allen Aspect and Zeilinger winning the Nobel Prize. So, it's all about quantum entanglement. So, you can just read through this. It is a quantum state of each particle of the group which cannot be described independently. That means they are related to each other. Right. Let me show you a quick example of quantum entanglement. So, quantum entanglement arises in a situation where we have a partial knowledge of the state of systems. Okay. So, for example, our systems can be of two objects we can call C's. So, uh, say for example, uh, it comes in two shapes, square or circular, right, in which we identify as this possible state. Then the four possible states would be, say for example, square, 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 circle, uh, or maybe it might be circular, circle, whatever. So, the, this table shows two examples of what the probabilities could be for finding the uh, in each of those four states, right? So you see that there's a 25% this and this and this. So we say that this uh, this one this one is independent if knowledge of the state of one of them does not give useful information about the state of the other. So our this table sh uh, says that if it is a square, we are still in the dark about the second shape. Now we move into another something uh, where there is a tangled entangled information. So, our second table says the demonstrations of extreme entanglement. So, let us see in that case where the, you know, this circular circular, this one has got a 50% chance and uh, we know that the second one would be absolutely zero. And when I got a square and a circle 50%, then the second will be absolutely zero. So, when the first is on a square, so is the second. Knowing the shape of one, we can infer the shape of the other with certain very good certainty. So, this is an independent one, right? We really don't know we are in dark and this is an entangled one. That means state 1 and state 2 are somewhere linked with each other, right? So, that is why we call that the states remain linked. That means they share a common unified quantum state. Now, remember entanglement is a primary feature of quantum mechanics. It is not present in classical mechanics. 
Okay, so once we have done, so this is also a kind of a simple example of quantum entanglement. The spin up and spin down shows it that. Okay, now we move to the central part of our video where I would be quickly taking you through a very interesting and a quick journey on what are the fundamental concepts of quantum mechanics that you should know. So we start with the first which is called a black body radiation. Now, thermal radiation is electromagnetic radiation emitted from the surface of an object due to the object's internal energy and if it is heated, it starts to emit light. We all know that. Now, the first model that was able to explain the full spectrum of thermal radiation, I would say, yeah, so it's a black body that absorbs all radiant energy falling into it and black body radiation is the corner stone. Now, these two gentlemen, Lord Rayleigh and James Jeans, uh, if I am right, James Jeans was present in the first Solvay conference and they showed that energy is continuous uh, through their experiments. Now, the first model uh, was able to explain the full spectrum of thermal radiation was put by Max Planck. Here is a young photograph of Planck and he put forward that a mathematical model in which the thermal radian Radiation was in equilibrium with a set of harmonic oscillators. And to produce the experimental result, he had to assume that each oscillator emitted an integer number of units of energy at its single characteristic frequency, which is called E equals to NHF, where N is a single integer 1, 2, 3. And this is how the energy emitted by an oscillator is being quantized. So, the experiment is what led to the discovery of field which revolutionized physics and quantum mechanics gives a more complete understanding at the fundamental level. So, here as I told you, the quantum of energy for each oscillator according to Planck was proportional to the frequency of the oscillator and rather than being able to emit any arbitrary amount of energy or continuous which was formulated by Rayleigh genes, he formulized that the oscillator or the energy is being quantized. The second part comes with uh, 1905 when Albert Einstein took an extra step. He suggested that quantization was not just a mathematical construct but that the energy in a beam of light actually occurs in individual packets which is called the photons and he used what is called a photoelectric effect. So, <coughs> The, using the Planck's constant and other, he, he finally found out that electrons is likely to be struck by a single photon, right? So, uh, he found the postulating that a beam of light is a stream of particles and photons and that if the beam is a frequency f, then each photon has an equal energy equals to hf. So, here it comes. So, classical electromagnetism which predicts that the electron should be proportional to the intensity of the incident radiation. Here it shows the intensity of the beam has no effect but only the frequency. Therefore, uh, the intensity of the beam has no effect, most important, only its frequency. And to explain this threshold effect, Einstein argued that it takes a certain amount of energy which is called the walk function. This is the equation right in front of you. This psi is the walk function. This is the Planck's constant and this is the threshold frequency. So, if the energy of the photon is less than the work function, then it does not carry sufficient energy to knock out the electron from the metal. The threshold frequency is the frequency of a photon whose energy is equal to the work function. This is something very, very central, the quantization of light and photoelectric effect. And I would request you to go through the equations of photoelectric effect the concepts and if possible also the derivation. Okay, so we come to the next fundamental concept and by the dawn of the 20th century, the evidence required a model of the atom with a diffused cloud if negatively charged electrons somehow moving around a positive nucleus. Now here is something which is called an emission spectrum of hydrogen. So when excited hydrogen gives off distinct light, now, the intensity of the light at different frequencies is also different. By contrast, uh, uh, using the Balmer's formula, we could show that how the frequencies of different sites are related, but we really don't know why. 
that means without explaining why these lines or this hydrogen spectrums are. And then came this great person in Niels Bohr in 1913. He proposed a new model of the atom that included quantized electron orbits. So you see an electron when it is transported from one shell to another it is quantized. Electrons still orbit the nucleus much as planets do orbit but they are permitted to inhabit only certain orbits not to orbit at an arbitrary distance. So the possible energies of photons given off by each element was determined by the differences in energy between the orbits and hence we got an answer that it doesn't move in continuous trajectory from one to another and as a result the electron would jump instantaneously and it would orbit at as was stable forever. So we got the answer now that why the emission of spectrum has got those lines right which was shown by the Balmer's formula and uh, why this is so and uh, uh, um, I mean to say the frequency is different. So another deep and another fundamental concept of quantum mechanics. We find another thing which is called a wave particle duality which is formed which was formed by Louis de Broglie. Now just like uh, light has both wave and particle, we saw it in wave particle duality, matter also has wave like properties. So all matters exhibit properties of both particles and waves. This is the momentum, this is the wavelength, this is the Planck's constant and uh, this has been proved through the double slit experiment of Thomas Young where matter behaving as a wave and even if the photons are sent through the slits one at a time there is still a wave present to produce the interference pattern. So what it shows is that neither the classical concept of particle nor of wave can fully describe the behavior of quantum scale objects either of photons or matter. So when you fire it shows particle, then when it interferes, it shows like a photon. So this is a very famous experiment which shows uh, that matter exhibits both particles and waves. Okay, now we come to a uh, something very very fundamental, and I can tell you uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of misunderstanding about this concept, which is called spin. Now, when certain elementary particles move through a magnetic field, they are deflected in a manner that suggests that they have a properties of little magnets. I mean to say in classical world, but unfortunately this analogy doesn't work and we have to come out to realize that it is a misleading conjecture. So spin is a purely quantum physical property and it has got no classical analogy. However, the word spin does not mean the spinning of a bicycle or a leg spin or off spin on, uh, on, a, on a game of cricket. Now, I can speak a lot and lot about spin. It is very interesting and is fundamental to quantum mechanics. I will make a separate video on that. I would like to tell you that can you see a microscope to gaze the stars and galaxies? Can you see that? Can you use a truck scale to measure the weight of a gold tree? Right? The answer is a big no. Why it is no? Because the scales do not match in classical and quantum system. So if you are using the same scale that you use a microstrut to state the galaxies and black hole just as it would not work. Same thing is that if you use a classical analogy of spin, momentum, rotation just like a bicycle or conservation of momentum, this spin of electrons or subatomic particles won't work out. I can tell you. But it has got certain properties. Electrons do have angular momentum. They have magnetic property. The angular momentum is from the rotational degree of freedom. Spin is a very fundamental property and property that is responsible for the structure of all matter. I will show you in a separate video that how this spins creates the bosons and the fermions and that is why you are watching this video sitting on a chair and you are not falling down. So remember that electrons absolutely are not spinning like bicycle wheels and I would request you to look into the spin statistics theorem, the Pauli exclusion principle, the boson and the fermions, the half and the integer spin and something which is very important called spinors. Spinors. This is just you know discovered around 50 years back. This is something important. So before you go into quantum mechanics, get the spin right.
There is another thing which is called the Copenhagen Interpretation. It is a collection of views about the meaning of quantum mechanics, principally by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. It is the oldest and it is taught the most. Just a quick view what it is. A system is described by a wave function. How wave function changes? It is defined by Schrodinger equation. Nature is probabilistic. It is not possible to know the values of all the properties at the same time. And wave particle duality, measuring devices are classical devices, and there is something which is called a corresponding principle. We come to uh, something which is very central, which is called the uncertainty principle. You all know the position and moment of a particle cannot be simultaneously measured. This is the equation of Werner Heisenberg. But here I would like to, you know, uh, tell you something very important that the uncertainty principle has been confused. Uh, with a related effect in physics which is called the observer effect uh, which notes that measurements of certain system cannot be made without affecting the system that is without changing something. Now Heisenberg utilized such an observer effect at the quantum level as a physical explanation of quantum uncertainty and it has since become clear uh, that the uncertainty principle is inherent. It is very inherent uh, to the properties of all wave-like system and that it arises in quantum mechanics simply due to the matter wave nature of quantum objects. So the uncertainty principle actually states a fundamental property of quantum system and it is not a system of the observational success of current technology. This is important. I would request you go through the mathematics of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Don't go through the intuitive understanding there are many websites, etc., which gives an uh, intuitive understanding. I would request not to do that and get and understand the implications part. Okay, few concepts which I will quickly brush over. This is very important. Uh, what is a quantum state, pure and mixed? You should have to go through that. Eigenstate and eigenvalues. So, in simple terms, you know, eigenstate is a state of quantized dynamic system. Uh, I would say in which one of the variables defining the system. So you can say when an object can definitely be pinned down in some respect, it is said to possess an eigenstate. When the wind function collapses, the position of an electron has been determined. So the electron state becomes eigenstate of a position. So you have to go through this eigenfunction, eigensystem, eigenspace, eigenbasis. Please go through what is called the Pauli's exclusion principle. Uh, this is uh, extremely important in terms of uh, going through the details and also through the applications of hydrogen atom and you can use Schrodinger equation with hydrogen atom uh, in order to understand and the Dirac wave equation. Now apart from that there are certain things which you can skip for the time being but if you're interested you can also learn quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics, standard model and quantum gravity the last one which I have just made two videos of string theory. Uh, I will just like to make an attention that don't skip what is called the postulates of quantum mechanics. These are important. The first one, as you know, is the wave function that the state of a quantum mechanical system is defined by psi, and this is the one. So the d tau located at r at a time t. So postulate number one should not be missed. Postulate two is that every uh, single operator has got a Hermitian, so the position with a hat momentum and kinetic energy. Postulate 3 with eigenvalues, any measurement of the observer with the operator A hat, the only values will you observe are eigenvalues A given by this. So just a quite quick reminder, reminder to you that please go through the postulates also and something which is called an average value of the observable, you can also go through that and the time dependent Schrodinger equation which is more or less looks like this. So just remember that is another postulate and the sixth postulate will be time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, now we come to the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Now first we will go what are the mathematics that are required and then we will learn through the books which are there and uh, then we will move forward. Before we start I would like to tell you that these mathematics uh, there are two ways of learning. Either you can learn just as a mathematics 
or you can say no i want a shortcut so i just want to learn the mathematics as much it is applicable to quantum mechanics both of them are fine both of them are okay i'm giving approach for both of them but if you talk to me personally i think that you should learn the concepts deep just for the learning of mathematics and you will see automatically it is applied to quantum mechanics okay i will be first talking about the non relativistic quantum mechanics and then the mathematics of relativistic quantum mechanics first you should be learning complex numbers second complex analysis now here are certain things which you can skip i will show you something which is absolute mandatory something you can just skip through that right you should learn linear algebra very important you should have an understanding of calc 1 2 3 and 4 uh you should learn very well all the different combination of partial differential equations functional analysis probability theory uh, fourier analysis a uh, group theory and if not topology right so this is a wholesome kind of an approach now for quantum mechanics what are the things that is an absolute must one complex numbers two linear algebra third calculus fourth partial differential equations fifth would be fourier analysis so you can definitely skip complex analysis function analysis group theory which is required for quantum field theory not required and topology there is a new field which is called topological quantum field theory so 1 2 3 4 5 these are the things which is an absolute must and these are the mathematical prerequisites please do not skip and i am now going to show you how and what are the best books to learn so first we will see the relativistic quantum mechanics what are the mathematics required so you require all of those and two more thing function analysis and tensor calculus i am not considering relativistic quantum mechanics in this video because it is far more complex i will just consider the a non relativistic quantum mechanics and what are the books so the first book would be this one which is by andresu and andreka complex numbers from a to z it is an absolutely excellent book i'll just show you it starts with complex numbers in algebraic form geometric interpretation powers of the number i conjugate of a complex number everything and uh, further you can see i have just given a small screenshot so complex numbers of geometry uh, this book i would say this is just an absolute bible you should start with this book simple easy to learn complex numbers are must the second recommendation which i would do is that roland roland dues introduction to the geometry of complex numbers now why i am saying the geometry because things will become more, much more visual so you see the straight line circle fundamental operations then the the transformation the, uh, the 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 conics everything is being covered so roland dues book introduction to the geometry of complex numbers is excellent and it will give you a best understanding now if you're dealing further i mean to say if you're taking a quantum field theory you need to have an understanding of complex analysis this is the absolute bible complex analysis by tristram needham i have shown you earlier tristram needham's differential geometry and complex analysis is equally good so you have uh, you know uh, introduction euler's formula applications cosine sine mobius transformations i mean so this is this is something great so you got riemann sphere mobius transformations matrices complex analysis by tristram needham is one of the best recommendation that i would say okay so there is another book of dover publication which is called mathematics for quantum mechanics uh i would say this is a good book around 150 pages but it is very fast i mean to say you know it doesn't build you right from the base right so you see it already starts with eigen value problems then it is with orthogonal functions then it goes to uh, sturm liouville problems and the linear vector spaces yes it is definitely a good book and it is dover book obviously it would be good but it it skips certain areas and doesn't build you from the base okay so in linear algebra i've got one book which is linear algebra for quantum theory now this is a typical book which has been customized for quantum theory 
uh, I, I would again suggest that please learn linear algebra at its depth. Don't skip anything, especially the Hermitian matrix, matrix operation. These are absolutely must. But here you see this is a customized book which uses quantum theory. Isn't it beautiful? This is a very good book. I've just given the uh, basic content or the uh, the idea. This is for quantum theory. Okay. Now, once we have established a firm foothold on the mathematics of quantum mechanics, let us see what are the best books to read. Now, I have divided into two parts, serious readings and light readings. Because quantum mechanics, there are things which you can just relax and read, not like general relativity, right? So, what are the books? The first one, Griffith's Quantum Mechanics. The second one, Theoretical Minimum by Professor Leonard Susskind. This is not quantum mechanics, but quantum electrodynamics by Richard P. Feynman. Principles of Quantum Mechanics by R. Shankar. These are the first set of books. And Dirac's Principle of Quantum Mechanics and Feynman Pictures on Physics. These are the books which are for serious readings, serious learners who wants to learn quantum mechanics and do the mathematics part. So for the lighter readings, I would suggest these books, right? This is by Sin Carroll, How to Teach Quantum Physics. This is a very good book by Manjit Kumar. Let me explain you one by one what is the sequence and how you should go about that. I will come to those parts later. Okay. The sequence of studying, first one will be Introduction to Quantum Mechanics by David J. Griffith. The reason is it is simple, it is illustrative, not much difficult mathematics. It is very easy to understand. But remember, here from chapter 3, Griffith starts with the formalism or the linear algebra and the mathematics part. So if you really want to learn the mathematics from Griffith's book, you should start not with chapter 1, but with chapter 3. So from chapter 3, then you go back to 1. It is one of the oldest and one of the best books. I mean to say, there is no, no alternative to this book. First, start with Quantum Mechanics by Griffith. My second recommendation would be Feynman's Lectures on Physics. It is awesome. It starts with the basics. It defines the spin, which I was talking very well. Then it defines the quantum state, the best explanation of Schrodinger equation and the hydrogen atom. So my second recommendation would be the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And this is an awesome book. So my third recommendation would be this one. Quantum Mechanics by R. Shankar. This is very good. And you know, it builds up that if you're stuck with the problem in classical mechanics, how quantum physics overcomes that. Right. It is good for someone at the middle level because it assumes certain level of mathematics. Notations are clear, uh, illustrative, very good. R. Shankar, Principles of Quantum Mechanics. My fourth recommendation would be Leonard Susskind's Theoretical Minimum. It is, I would say, it is a very good book. I mean, say it's, it's absolutely excellent, very lucid, very, you know, simple. But remember that it actually gives you a kind of a, a basic, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It gives you a kind of a overall understanding. It doesn't really go to the depth of the mathematics, which Griffith or fin Feynman does. So, yes, it is an easy read, quick read. Uh, by Professor Susskind, one of the greatest explanators of uh, physics and mathematics, but it is, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't deal with that level of mathematics with Griffith, Feynman, or R. Shankar's book, too. Okay, now the sequence of study, the fifth book would be Quantum Mechanics by Paul Dirac. Who else can write a book other than one of the greatest contributors of quantum mechanics? But remember, it is a heavy read, it is a little bit advanced. You should have a good mathematical background. This is my fifth one. Okay, and if I take the light readings, I mean to say you can always, you know, relax on a sofa or a couch <laughs> and just go through the, uh, the, the the bizarre world of quantum mechanics. This is, I would say, a good book. Uh, it, it doesn't quite contain that level of mathematics, but it is good one. The second is Manjit Kumar. I, 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 if I am not wrong, yeah, Manjit Kumar is basically a, a, a reporter in New York Times, Nature, many things. And this is a book which has got immense amount of interesting stuffs. Just go through that book. Quantum 
Einstein board and the entire debate and how it happened. This is an awesome book which contains a lot of history, a lot of insights and I can tell you, you won't be able to put it down. My favorite comes the third one, which is by David uh, Kuse. It is Beyond Uncertainty and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to love this book. This contains a lot about Heisenberg's life, his, uh, you know, his contribution, the quantum world, a lot of history. Uh, it, it is something, you know, it is a kind of a book which you would just start reading right now and you cannot sleep and you have to finish those things. So, one, two, three. These are the light reading books. I won't recommend the rest. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Here I would like to give you a small note of caution. Now, see what happens for young people, those who are learning physics, especially quantum mechanics. Uh, the good part is that quantum mechanics, the mathematics is much easier. So, in US, people take more general relativity in their masters in science. In India, they take MS, uh, the quantum mechanics, because the mathematics is easy and the scope is much more. First, what I would like to tell is that a lot has been written about quantum theory and there has been a lot of misinterpretations. You know, you, you, ta you, you, you take things like consciousness, etc. It is there. Dr. Penrose has been working with that. But there are a lot of misinterpretations. People have been misguided. I would request you to please, please stay away from popular science and those books which claims that I can teach you quantum mechanics in two minutes or weird world of quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics and consciousness, it is true. But this has been, lot has been misinterpreted. And I would say that there are a lot of wrong claims. So this is a note of caution. Uh, you know, the, 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 the knowledge that you're gaining, if it is directed in a wrong way, especially for young people, I always make uh, Instagram reels and I try to tell them, please do not go through that because these are not the way quantum mechanics is dealt. These are not the way in which physics or mathematics should be read. Uh, it, it, this popular science and misinterpretation and showing the young people an ultra romantic path is destroying the entire learning. So my sincere request to you is not go through those. So we finally come to the last part of our video where I would be discussing about the YouTube lectures. Not much. I just taken three or four. The first would be Stanford and here is the a handle of YouTube and I would like to tell you to go through Professor Leonard Suskind's videos on quantum mechanics. It starts from the right from the basics, number one. Second is that he will start teaching you with the basic theoretical minimum mathematics that you need and then he will jump into quantum mechanics. So the books that I told you, the theoretical minimum by Leonard Suskind is covered in those 10 lecture series. So, number one, Stanford lecture by our dear Professor Leonard Suskind, starting with the base, it is absolutely excellent. My second recommendation would be Cosmo Learning. So, you can see this handle and this is a good amount of lectures and the number of lectures are 27. These are very good. It starts and deals with probabilities and it gives you a thorough insight on the lectures. My third recommendation would be IIT and this is the handle. You can just go to their channel and subscribe. And this is, I think, by Dr. Balakrishnan. I should not say. Anyway, I just forgot. And this is a series of 31 lectures which comprises a good amount of details of quantum mechanics. Please go through that. This is equally good. My last recommendation would be MIT Open Courseware. Here is the handle. And there is a series of lectures of quantum mechanics. But remember, MIT has got a lot of advanced quantum mechanics, but the basic quantum mechanics. And you would be happy to uh, find that the numbers are 115. So there are a total of 115 lectures of, uh, of, of, of MIT. And you can just go through it one by one. So that's it. That's the kind of a roadmap. What are the fundamentals that you should know? A mental preparation. What is the paradigm shift? The quantum system. How we moved into the world of probabilities. The fundamental concepts of quantum mechanics. The postulates. The mathematical prerequisites. The suggested books. Now the question is that where can I get those books? The good news is that I have got all the books 
<laughs> the soft copies obviously so what you need to do is that either you can ping me in whatsapp or you can email me which is there in the uh, outro of the video or you can find it in my description and you can just have to uh, subscribe to this channel and the other channel on general relativity i'm going to mail you all the books yes i've got all those books just get in touch with me i'm going to mail you and send you all those books so that's it it's a complete roadmap i know the video has been long but i have to make it because this is a very demanding subject please do subscribe to my channel physics for students and please do put up the comment and i would be coming up new year with a new surprise which i'm not going to tell you and it will be published on the 1st of january on my channel and you're really going to enjoy that till then goodbye merry christmas and wish you a happy new year and we i will see you on the very first day of new year with yet another surprise till then wishing you all the best a happy new year stay safe and stay happy and goodbye thank you for watching this video we appreciate your time and patience If you want to connect with us and provide further feedback, comment or suggestions, please email us at contact.physicsforstudents@gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. See you soon in the next video.